we're, we're, we're back up and we're live again. Um, so if you can give a wave to our, uh, our people joining us uh, uh, live on, on the stream. We've had quite a few colleagues tweeting in from various offices including pictures of, uh, of fish and chips, I think, and some uh, refreshments that they've brought in. So that sounds, that sounds good. Um, so uh, welcome back to the second half of um, Paul's part with us today. And Paul's now going to focus a little bit more on his views around leadership and the entrepreneur of, of the future. Welcome yeah. back over to Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so th this is a, a shorter section, um, uh, hopefully 20-25 minutes of, and then we'll get 10-15 minutes of Q&A, which would be great. But I thought I'd just start with another little video which I found, which is kind of hangover from the first half, but hopefully you enjoy it. It's the world that we're asking our children to inherit, and it's a volatile, uncertain, complex world. That's the world that we live in, that we're passing on, what we've created, um, and it means that there's no simple solutions, there aren't even simple questions that we 
professional. Um, and we need real leadership to be able to get our, their heads around how we deal with a world like that. But the children of today are growing up in that world, so that is, that is their experience as they're growing up. And finally, this whole thing about profit with purpose to gain and finding those leaders that can make business a good part of society. You know, think of the banking industry at the moment. There are good bankers out there. There are good banking companies out there at the moment trying to do this stuff, and it's getting lost in some of the bigger things that aren't good. Um, and it's the strong leaders that, um, that, that, that need to be strong uh, to be able to change that. So then I sort of did a little mind map of what I found leadership qualities to be. If we're trying to define it, what is it when you see it? And um, I got them out of pasting sort of various things into a little mind map. And, and when I sort of looked at it, I was really disappointed, I guess, because the words that I found out on the internet there talking about leadership, I don't think that defines leadership at all. I think those words define management. Thank you. They're managers' words, and, and, and we don't want managers. As we need managers, but we need leaders to manage, to lead managers. Um, and you know, for those of us that are aspirational to try and make differences and change, change things, there's something missing from those definitions. And I think it's the, the missing piece has got two sides to it. Um, and I can pass over quite quickly one of them because we talked about it a little bit. But it's values. The, the, the leadership is trusted and, and, and works when there's a set of values behind it and people get where they're coming from. Because values bring words like that out. And those words are human words. They're emotional words. They're sort of, they're not the, the, the nouns that came out before or the verbs that came out before. Um, and they're the sort of words that lead, lead define leadership through values, through not sitting behind a desk, but through being with people and interacting with people as sort of human words. So that's the value side of it. The second part of that jigsaw piece, I think, is about inspiration. And I think it's not a leader's, um, it's not the fact that the leader is inspirational, it's the fact that the follower is inspired by the leader. That's the critical bit. It, you, you, it, the, the leaders, the best leaders, are ones that give feelings of inspiration to others. It's not that they're inspirational themselves. There's a subtle difference in there, but I think it's a really important one. It's not what, it's not about you as a leader. It's about the other person, the person that's following you or being led. Inspiration is, is the other part of, of critical to leadership because both of those things together give this very human thing called trust. You know, as human beings, we inherently understand the value of trust. <laughs> We trust that when we put our credit card or debit card in the machine in the hole, the wall, that we'll get the right amount of money, and it comes from our bank account. When we, um, when a consumer opens one of our packets, or you open a can of soup or something, you believe you trust that that will be soup in the right flavour and the right quality that you ordered. Um, when we, when we play sports, um, we trust in our teammates. So it's a very human thing that very is very difficult to explain to for aliens or somebody who came down. That, that it's very human, and that that is the leadership. Uh, stardust, I think, that, that, that we miss. Because I think it used to be easy to lead. Let's go back to 1963 as the theme. Um, you know, in, in business, because the big companies could stand on a pedestal and could talk about what they were doing, um, or that what they wanted people to hear about what they were doing. And they could put big adverts on for big prices in cinema and television, and it was really difficult to challenge whether they were telling the truth or not. And the leaders had a platform because of the deference to them, and they, they were pretty much unchallenged. And it was it was like the era of the big man, but the one person could lead. You look at in politics, all the African presidents in the 60s and 70s that were big men. Um, and now, it's much different. It, it's it could be much harder. It could be much easier. It could be much harder because it's about leadership is about collaboration, in my view. It's about getting people together and leading as a team rather than being the one person. And that takes time, and that takes trust and values and things you've got to align, but maybe it's much harder because you've got to get a leadership team together, but maybe it's easier because in this world of business democracy, where there's Twitter and there's everything else out there, you as a leadership team or you as a leader can be challenged constantly about your decisions and why you're making your decisions, and that's why values are really important because someone can say something on there now or on Facebook or you know um, at events like this. And, and, and um, shareholders meetings, all of those things are much more um, robust than they were before. Um, and it, it comes down to trust, but that's 
assume a man there, but ooh, the thing I was thinking about was those things, those leaders of the future are going to exhibit traditionally feminine um, values, traditional feminine sort of leadership skills, skills, uh, collaboration, compassion, um, listening, compromise, those sort of things, I think, are the, 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 the leadership, the sort of more HR people sort of thing, empathy sort of thing, um, because in the future, staff are going to be harder to retain, and uh, they're going to have more choices, and customers, and it's going to be much more of an open market. So um, I think the feminine qualities are going to be really critical for the leaders of tomorrow. And I should have put a woman there, shouldn't I? Um, but it, it, going back to trust, it takes years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. We know that. There's some classic sort of CEOs that have said the wrong thing at the wrong time and, and, and live to regret it. Um, and I thought I could just think how we, from both an Alice Kitchen point of view and my own leadership within my organization point of view, try to think of the leadership skills we just talked about. So we can go back to our values. They're there. Where they infiltrate everything from, you know, as I was saying before, the recruitment. We ask questions not directly about those values, but implied within those, those um, uh, the questions we ask in an interview. Um, to, to, to understand whether there's a mindset fit rather than a skill set fits in our interviews. And then the training and the promotions and the bonuses are all linked to, to, to these things. Um, and this kitchen leadership has taken, you know, I can think of three areas where I feel we feel very proud that we've led. We've led in innovation in products and creating better food than there was there before. We've led in using academic research to understand how children develop, how they emotionally, psychologically, <coughs> physiologically develop, and how they're listened to by parents and things. There's a load of stuff on YouTube. You'll see, we'll, you'll see in work we've done that around there. But it, it all revolves around food as not a, just a taste experience, but it's, it's a multisensorial experience. And so how does sound affect a child, anybody, a person's ability to uh, want food? If we, if we think we just closed our eyes for a second and thought the best meal we'd had in the last six months, um, we'd all think, I'm sure, of not necessarily the menu or the meal itself, but the people we were with, the restaurant maybe, the location, the entertainment, the service, all of those things are stimulating our memory, and it's exactly the same for, for, for a child. And we've done a lot of academic research to show that it, that is true. And then the averting arrest is for disaster thing, where we're stepping outside business to try and change public policy. We feel as though we're taking a leadership position on that, which will all be great for our brand and our business, but it's the right thing to do. And then my own leadership, how I think about myself with my team, comes down to, I like three things, but three things. First of all, it's that sense of purpose. What's our mission? Do you, as the newest person coming in, get what our mission is, about our tiny, tiny touch points? Do you, as the sort of most junior person and the most senior person aligned in, in terms of how you can contribute to that ultimate goal. Do you have the autonomy to make your own mistakes? You know, so, so I started off as a one-man band and now there's 60 odd people and I've done basically bits of all of their work and they're all doing it much better than I, I would and I'm not, my job isn't to step in and say, well I did that, we used to do it this way. That's, you want to do it that way, do it. You make a mistake, you make a mistake. We'll, try and have a, a culture and a system where you don't make the same mistake twice, but uh, that autonomy to feel as though you're empowered is really important. And then the ability to master your subject, your role, uh, your industry, um, and, and training, and, and sort of um, on-the-job training, etc., cetera, um, is really important. So, but we're thinking about the future, and we're thinking about the next generation of leaders. And, you know, they're coming from a world where they think they can change the world. Which is really great. Mm -hmm. they, they've sort of they've got this almost toddler-like optimism of anything can happen, which is great. And that's kind of mm -hmm. we perhaps had that before. But the, the, the difference between what's possible and what's impossible is getting smaller all the time. It's something that I absolutely believe in. We were just talking about the 3D printers that's just produced pens. That's here five years ago. What I was told by somebody at Google, that technically you can 3D print food now. You can. 3D print food that will constantly get worse in taste if it's a bad food, or better in taste if it's a good food. And you think, whoa, that's that's all what way up. But but that difference between, you know, think about jobs that we've created now. They, most jobs that our education system provide uh, educates us for, they, the jobs that are at the end didn't exist when we were being educated, and that's increasingly going to happen. But but we work things out. So that's the belief there. So. 
I'm optimistic about the future because I think the the youth youth will be more empowered than they were before, leaders will be younger than they were before, and the youthful spirit, youthful spirit really, rather than youth in age, it's a sort of state of mind rather than a, a stage of age sort of thing, but um, youthful spirit I think is what there is an abundance of more than ever, and those people are getting leadership positions more than they used to. And I'm going to go back to 19, the 60s anyway to um, talk about one of my the political heroes, I suppose, is Robert Kennedy from, from the States in the 60s. And he gave this fantastic speech in South Africa in 1966 about the power of youth and youthful spirit. And it was sort of 50 years ahead of its time when you think about the things he was talking about. He was talking about the, the, the youth of that day, and this is so much more true today, were more united by their age contemporaries around the world than they were by their parents and their bosses and things in the way that they think and the way they act. And you fast forward that to now, where um, you know you can work in any part of the world and be a colleague as though you're sitting next to, to each other. You can get all sorts of opinions on, on, in real time on Skype and Facebook and things, and they're more united with 20-year-old in, in Chile or Zambia or somewhere than they are um, with perhaps their parents and their bosses and the people that they live next door to. And I think that's critical in a, a fundamental change in the world. But Robert Kennedy identified that, and he was so optimistic about the future of youth, but he, he highlighted four sort of things that, that youth needed to overcome to take that leadership position. And um, I'll, I'll run through them just now because they're all reasons not to take leadership. The first one is about futility. And it's about that feeling that none of us can change the world and none of us can um, uh, ha have an impact because we're too small. And you know, I'm standing here as a business that was once the smallest business in the world because I just set it up and I didn't have any money and had a debt and all of that stuff. And last month, I was having a meeting with the chief executive of Walmart, the biggest company in the world. They turn over half a trillion dollars, employ two million people. And I'm having a meeting with him as two people, and we're talking about our businesses overlapping: the smallest business in the world and the biggest business in the world. And um, th so that's not futile. And it doesn't mean that any individual, we, we, we do things, in, it's not futile because we can't change things individually, we can change things collectively. None of us kind of can perhaps you know, be on the TV and be on all this greatness, but collectively all little changes that we make can make fundamental changes. And I think that the, 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 the youth of today understand that and that conference in South Africa showed me that in spades. But things aren't futile. Individuals can go through a raft of companies and people and individuals that have changed things. Um, uh, uh, is why I Second thing to overcome is expediency. This idea that there are so many problems in the world or so many challenges within your business that you have to act now and you have to act quickly and you have to do it now. And by doing that, you compromise, you automatically compromise your principles in doing it and your vision and your values because it's just got to be done. And I think that's rubbish as well. Because you can see the successful companies are the ones that have purpose and profit behind them. You can see the trend towards investors buying shares in public companies because of their people and their planet um, good as well as their profit good. Um, so, and we don't need to, we, we want to be the tortoise, remember, we don't want to be the hare. We can tackle difficult subjects with long term solutions. The third thing that he identified was about timidity and about the fact that it's also overwhelming and we don't we feel as though we don't want to stand out from the crowd <coughs> and he sort of pointed out that it's actually more brave to stand up to your friends and the people that you kind of work with and agree with to force change rather than your enemies and you know there you can think in our current times now people sort of in Philippines and people in Afghanistan and stuff there are some you know some amazing people here though we don't hear about because they stood up to be counted and the final thing he talked about was comfort. Um, and that idea that leaders with the privilege of an education and the privilege of a good job will start to think that their mission in life is to earn as much money as they can or to have all the material comforts that they can. And you know, that's that's a perhaps a very easy thing to to be seduced by if you're in your early twenties and it's your first job and you've got your first pay packet and you're 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 sort of on the way and you can afford things you can afford before. And the trick is to encourage, encourage that, but also encourage a sense of community and a, a, a sense of um, leadership in, 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 um, in society. Other challenges he didn't touch on, which 
kind of is, is something that's emerged over the last 50 years, is if all these young people are going to take these leadership positions in the next few years, what happens to the rest of us? And there's going to be more of us than mm -hmm. ever before, and we need a society where we've got something to do, and we've got a value in society, and we can contribute to society as well. And, you know, in 20 years' time, it's our children that are going to work out how, how, how we're dealt with, and um, that's a challenge for them to have a society that's compassionate. So if we think about the leadership opportunities for youth, and um, it's no coincidence that I picked a picture there with, with women in, um, and, and go back to, you know, there's going to be many more women leaders, I think, um, uh, 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 in the future. Um, what, are, what, are, what are the qualities of youth, that, and youthful spirit, that really resonate? Well, the first, I think, is energy. Is that energy that is not diminished by the fact that somebody's tried it before and told them that you can't do it that way. And we're all being the same like that in the past, but they're going to be in a position where they're in a position of more leadership early. So as long as they've got that energy, we can change things faster. They also come with fresh perspectives and new ideas, born in an era where you know, instant access to all information in the world in free is something that I didn't grow up with, we didn't grow up with. So they can think of creatively fresh perspectives and new ideas, and the world's much more diverse now in terms of multicultural and stuff where new ideas can easily come, come through. Um, third area really then is about flexibility and the idea that the leaders, the employees, the people of the future will be flexible, will have a view that there's flexibility and mobility in their jobs, in their careers. Some may work from home, some may work in Brazil and it, they can communicate and they can be just as effective in their jobs either way and they will have a view that they have a career. There isn't one company for their career but many companies and maybe many industries and many, many, maybe many skills. Um, we've got to encourage the leaders to pass on that leadership across that, that uh, flexibility but I'm excited by that, that ability to be able to cross different um, industries and areas. And the final thing is I believe that this generation that's coming up next is the one that's been most driven by values that has mm -hmm. ever existed because they are more exposed to all the issues around the world because of the internet and because of rolling television news and all of that sort of thing and they are believed that they can contribute a pound to the Philippines and that will help. They can uh, contribute a minute to a political campaign or a sit-in or whatever it is and that, that will make a difference and they're driven by values and that's a really optimistic um, mm -hmm. thing for the future. So youth can lead and do, and they have done for generations. It's not this new new thing now. You've got exceptional people. So that's Thomas Jefferson, who in uh, 250 years ago um, uh, created the uh, American Constitution, the idea that everyone was created equal, and that's the document. He was 32 year, years old when he created that. Joan of Arc freed France from, from us um, all those years ago. Richard Branson was 19 when he first set up his companies. Um, uh, and Anita Roddick there was in the 20s with the body shop and changed the way cosmetics are and ethics in, in business. Gates and Jobs, they were, teenage, well, they were teenagers when they first thought about setting up their companies. They were in the 20s when they became um, the leaders in the computer area. And a generation later, Facebook came along and Zuckerberg in his 20s became a multi, multi billionaire, no doubt. Um, and then only this year, a 15 year old girl, Malala, you know, just, just has changed the world of Afghanistan women and girls and the world I think will do over education rights for equal rights and education is an important thing for children. So a bit more inspiration after that sort of whirlwind thing from, from some leaders. So back to my mate um, Kennedy, Robert Kennedy. He said some men see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. Now as an entrepreneur that's exactly how I've tried to live my business and my life and saying challenging things all the time why can't that be done 90% of the time maybe it can't but 10% of the time it can I'll do it and I think leadership of, uh, of tomorrow will ask more of those but the second question than the first one and then you've got Gandhi who said for people who are trying to do change and force change through leadership first they'll ignore you then they'll ridicule you then they'll fight you and then you'll win and that's kind of uh, any change. You know, when we're dealing with our team and stuff, and we've got bad news to deliver, they'll be angry and then they'll deny and all of that. That's kind of the same curve, and they'll accept it eventually. But that's, you know, his philosophy, and he's an individual that's, that's, that's changed the world. 
And then my sort of contribution to this is a very simple one. It's the key is we. The key to all of this within our business, a successful business, is we as a leadership team, we as a bigger team in achieving things. Outside of our business, our business's place in society is we with our government and our communities. And that will be much more in the future, is my belief, in everything in life than I um, as we go forward. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to leave. I can just put on the little Dylan again, the little baby, um, just so we leave with a smile. We start with a smile and we leave with a smile. If I can just find how to do this. What's up, Mr. Dylan? Mind it? Off you go. BBC. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, we've already seen some questions starting to come through over Twitter, and um, Paul, um, our innovation coach, Paul Taylor, is now going to uh, chair that, our Q and A session with you. So he's been. Uh, uh, madly coordinating some of those. So we'll take some questions from the floor, but also some from, uh, from our Twitter feed. Well, you are now. Okay. I was leaning forward on my mic <laughs> like that. So. Well, there's some frantic emails saying to Paul, lean forward, Paul's mic's not working. So I did send him a, 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 an email saying, any of the duties, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> Covered in the contract. Right, it was, don't go to the toilet right now. <laughs> don't go to the toilet like that. Right, okay, I'm sure there are loads and loads of questions. I can't hand up already. So I'm going to try and distribute questions between people in the audience and also people who have commented on Twitter and through other forums as well. Um, if you're in the audience, can you just announce who you are first as well? Because obviously it's been live streamed and people might wonder who on earth that person is. And I'll give you a mic. Absolutely. Uh, Caro, you were first. Go ahead. Thanks, Paul. That was really interesting. Uh, one of the things that you touched on quite early was um, people and making sure that the people that you recruit have the same values that you do to make sure that the company continues to have those values and we feel very similar. Um, how do you go about making sure that you recruit the right people? Mm. Um, everybody, we have a three, at least a three interview stage interview process and the second one that we, at the end of the first one we leave them our values and we ask them to come back and um, create a new product, but in, show us how our values touch each of that new product is generally the question. And then the third interview is just me, and I'll only ask about the values, but I won't, I'll ask them in a way that I'm asking, are you childlike? I'm asking them questions <laughs> that they'll show that they're childlike. Um, one of the things we've tried to do, and I hope we can do this, but it's proving more difficult, uh, is like a psychometric test, basically, with those values as the, as the, as the thing. Because we, well, we've done sort of a pilot in, internally, because we, if we can find internally who is the best person at being childlike, the best person at being business-minded, then we can build you know, things like from where people sit to groups that cross uh, department groups that they go on, those sort of things. So, um, and then the final thing is really, as part of the interview process, we um, say, uh, the interview process doesn't end till three months' time after your probation period, and we are going to be watching your values over that time, and you, we will have an open thing as these are your goals. Um, and we, you know, for a sort of cuddly company, we don't necessarily always take on people up. If we, it's part of the interview process, um, and um, you know, if, if they don't show those values, as a small company, a wrong peg in the wrong hole, don't really causes a lot of um, trouble. So um, they're the things we try and do. I, I think there was a lot when you were talking about that that certainly struck with us at Bromford have tried to develop the same approach. Can I ask you with that, you know, you talked about, you know, the world over were essentially the same. Has that kind of approach in terms of recruitment translated to, say, the States? Uh, yes, although there are differences. I, I find Americans, it's cultural, so they're much more direct. They'll tell you what they want, and they expect you to tell them exactly what you want of them. Three short sentences. It's yeah. like, generally, what do you want from me? What, how am I going to do it? And how am I going to be rewarded? <laughs> and, and so that's culturally different, but, you know, that's kind of 
we can learn, we, we, we can take the best out of different cultures and, and, and um, uh, cross border them. Um, but, but generally, people are the same. They, they, they can, you know, they want to be motivated. Nobody I, above a certain level, nobody is motivated just by the pay packet that they take home. Yeah. Um, it's not more to Absolutely. Me. Thank you. Another question. Sam. That's all, Sam. Another question. Oh, Will. Hi, Paul. Thanks for that. Um, William Lilly from Bromford, uh, New Ventures Manager. I'm doing a lot of work around health and wellbeing. So I was just really interested in the Leicester pilot that you're involved in and whether or not you see, you hope to see more of those types of pilots and also whether or not you see an opportunity within our housing sector to engage this type of activity. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, and usually for me, I, I wanted to do things step by step and by doing it big to start with, but um, took that advice and um, we were approached by a number of councils. Leicester seemed great because it's multicultural, there's, uh, there's a lot, lot going on there and it's got some, some real challenges. Um, that activity we'll do is taking most of those eight ideas we've had and doing something. So as does a great part, as has partnered with us. There's three big stores in Leicester. We'll do some of those things I was talking about in store um, with, with Asda. Uh, it's a market town, so we can do stuff as pop up in, in in the market square with just a football team and a rugby team and a basketball team. We can get those people down there and show cooking is very easy um, for anybody. Um, and uh, we love to be able to show that that worked. They put public money in, we've put our own money in, the community's put time and money in um, uh, to, to roll it out elsewhere. So we're hoping to get a lot of press and stuff around it. Um, the idea of you know working with um, somebody like Bromford is great because many of the challenges, the, the challenges we've discovered about healthy eating come down to two broad things. Either it's about cost and accessibility, or it's about sort of confidence and um, uh, availability, if you like. But um, and, and that confidence, lack of confidence, means that many people on in life anyway, I was going to say social housing, but anywhere in life, there are not enough people who know how to cook. There are many people who don't have a saucepan at home or a fridge at home and all of that sort of thing that, um, you know, and when you look in America, there are people. It's cheaper to eat fast food than it is to go to the supermarket, and you can walk, you know, 500 yards to a fast food joint, and you've got to walk five miles to a, a, a supermarket. So, the, 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 there's many. So, the, the lack of cooking skills and the lack of a good diet is a social. It's a consequence of the social issue, of which housing and the way people live together is a fundamental part of it. So, so the whole social thing of sitting down and having a meal together, of I don't know, doing a shopping list together, of uh, of going to the shops, that sort of thing, is where I think you would be incredibly influential in helping change um, things. Absolutely, I'd love to work with you. For conversation afterwards. Yeah, and you mentioned the importance of fathers in the household, and you said you could expand <laughs> upon that. Um, was that more in terms of what you mentioned about diet or in terms of future leadership or um, I think would be interesting? Well, we're observing a trend really is um, although 80 something percent of family shopping is done by the mum still, <coughs> the trends behind that are there are 10 times more fathers that are stay at home fathers than there were 10 years ago. So, so yep. you know, they're looking after the children. They're they're doing the work in the home, um, uh, and fathers are more involved in their <laughs> children's diet. They may not be doing the shopping, but they know what brands or foods that they're having. They may be feeding them more often. They're playing with them more often, um, and that's this world we're moving with, with where roles are much less traditional roles are much less defined. And um, uh, yeah, I, I think that. You know, we're thinking about how can we work with supermarkets to make a father feel less um, the odd one out or whatever yeah. if they're going down the baby aisle. Yeah. So maybe so there's a number of thing, things like that that yeah, again it's to do with confidence again. The economy is to do with confidence, isn't it? It's, you know, is a father confident enough to go pick up his kids at school when there's loads of mums around, go shopping when there are all a load of mums around, and cook himself when there are loads of mums around, and more and more are. So I think that's changing. 
Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, here's a question that's come in via Twitter. It's come from uh, John Popham, who's asked whether you think the internet is al allowing us to adopt more distributed and almost like collaborative leadership models in terms of the future leadership mm. and mm. how that connectivity is affecting leadership? Mm. Yes, undoubtedly. Um, I think uh, you know, little things like LinkedIn groups where you get people of similar interests together in a little room and they're all talking about the same things, but they're all collaborating, they're all learning off each other. So these virtual, you know, you can get virtual boardrooms now and you can get, you know, virtual um, uh, focus groups and things like that where you, you're all learning off each other. So and, 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 you know, when we look at a generation that has grown up as this is natural as writing, in fact, probably more natural than writing, um, you know, there's the classic stories of three-year-olds, they don't obviously know to read or write by that, but they know, you know, so someone with a BlackBerry, she's going like this and she says, it's broken. It's a BlackBerry yeah. on iPhone. Um, it's going to be just in, 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 their, in their bloodstream to, um, to, 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 to use the internet and to subsequently collaborate. I think, that, I think there are trends that, you know, girls, and this may lead to female leadership and stuff, girls use social media much more for communication and for collaboration, and boys use it to find out stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I don't know. And it's really interesting when you talk about you know the future of leadership and particularly young leaders in terms of how they're pick how that knowledge is being distributed from people who've got loads of years of experience to people who are just starting yeah. out is really important. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Another question. Sorry. Go there and there. <laughs> Oh. Next one of us, so we're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a ranking order here. <laughs> yeah. I'll let hold back. <laughs> Sorry, I've hijacked it, haven't I? It's uh, Chris Garrett, the MD at, MD at BERT. Um, really interesting what you were saying about profit with purpose and think profit has got a massive uh, role to play in, in shaping society. Corporations have a huge role to, to play in giving back. Um, you tend to see, uh, the research that we do tends to show that a lot of organizations that have real purpose and are making a difference to those that have it ingrained in them at the outset. So it's, it's new companies, new emerging companies. Do you think there's a way that you can persuade um, the, the big boys? I remember one of Nike's visions once was to destroy Adidas. Can you persuade them to have a different vision that's more about, more about purpose? Can these big multinationals really be persuaded to change course because they're juggernauts moving in such a, yeah. a big direction? Uh, I, I, my belief is that um, uh, just now we as consumers buy things for much more reasons than perhaps a generation ago did because there's more information to us. So it may be the providence or it may be the uh, country of origin or it may be the localness of it. Oh, loads of different things besides just price and quality which are uh, the traditional things. Because we do that as consumers, we we kind of vote, if you like, which successful businesses or not. That will flow through. I don't think it has done yet, but it will flow through to boardrooms and share prices and values of companies and things when people are buying shares and institutions are buying shares looking at the whole thing, not just the balance sheet and the P&L. And those leaders of those companies will need to respond to what consumers want then for their share price. And I think people are more um, be nice to each other than not be nice to each other sort of thing. It will, it will come through. So it really jars when I think the, the old days of confrontation are going to be replaced by collaboration. Great. Let's hope so. Anne. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm exactly if I'm director at Shropshire Housing Group and a former Bromford colleague. And I miss you all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, a, a, a controversial question first, which is I was wondering whether or not your your uh, pods, your little packets, are biodegradable. Okay, not controversial. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I also wanted to just uh, briefly share, because people were talking about how can housing associations contribute to this. Shropshire obviously is a small place, but it's got a reputation for great food. And uh, we at Shropshire Housing Group are trying to um, create a link with great local food. So we've set up Grow, Cook, Share. We, we do work with schools around teaching kids to to cook. Our estates have community gardens established. We're growing fruit, fruit trees as a standard part of all of our developments. We're working with Fort Hall Farm, the community-owned farm. 
So I think there are ways that mm. you can do those kind of joint investments. Brilliant. Yeah, that's you know exactly an uh, a example. Local community, if we put it in that that, that respect, um, mm. with a business. So all we'll that for that. Um, your first question. Um, so this, th th this gets asked a lot on our um, website, or and the thing is, the, the the first answer is no, and then there's a but, and there's all the good things that we do about that. But people read no, so it's a very busy life. So they're asking a quick question, and the answer is no. So it is it, it is it's difficult for any business, you know. You can think of yin and yang, but you're trying to do good over here, but there's an implication from what you're doing for, for, for anything. And I guess we've prioritized health, and we do know that we have a, an environmental impact, and we are trying to do as much as we can to, to, to reduce that. So what we do is, and you use the word biodegradable, I'll come back to that in a second, it's usually recyclable, um, uh, and you can't put them in the green bin um, at the moment. You can if you're in Germany, you can if you're in Sweden, so it's it's something that's wrong in our local government and the way that the, business, that the country's put together. Um, but we, we, we knew that. We knew that people who are into organic food are going to be asking that sort of question. So what we do is have this thing called uh, upcycling. It's called Ella Cycle, our brand of it, um, whereby we get consumers to send back empty pouches. They get some money donated to charity for doing that. It's all free for them to do it. And we make stuff, new stuff, upcycle, higher value good out of those things, so bags, pencil cases, things like that. Now, because the consumer has to do all the work, it is a relatively low amount. When the supermarkets could have bins there or stuff, it will, so we're trying to push for all of those things. Um, so, you know, and we've got to be honest with those answers in the um, when we're asked those questions. Uh, um, and you know, that's 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 the answer. Biodegradable is an interesting one because we really looked at trying to do biodegradable packaging. We found some, and. What the answer is, is actually it all gets much more complicated because we found a way of doing it. We could get a plastic, effectively, that's biodegradable. But it's made in China, where people are now planting maize instead of rice. And they're planting maize to become biodegradable plastic rather than rice to eat. And that causes all sorts of hunger and all sorts of issues in their society about what they traditionally do. It then goes from China to America to get converted into plastic. By plane or by ship, I don't know, but it does an impact there. And then it comes over here. And then ultimately, although it's said to be biodegradable, it's industrially biodegradable, <coughs> not um, uh, residentially biodegradable. So you can't put it on your compost heap. So it's sold, it's missold, in my view, um, and it's complicated and it raises a whole load of challenges. So, yeah, we're in a world where people want simple answers because we're all so busy and nothing is simple, but you. So you've got to say no is, is the honest answer to your question. Thank you. I've got time for a very quick question. Final opportunity. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> both at the same time. Here we go. Just one. Just one. <laughs> the killer I will defer. <laughs> no, I guess I'm just interested in distilling. <laughs> Nick Collins from Bromford. Okay. <laughs> Well, you're distilling everything, and you've had this journey as an entrepreneur owner. I know you've got different relationships now with investors, so you're having to handle different relationships. But also looking to the future, from everything you've said to us this morning, from everybody who's watching, there's a lot of young leaders in the room as well. What do you think is the most important legacy you'll hope to leave as a leader? Of all the things you've said, what do you think is the most important one that you'd want to leave as a legacy? The, 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 if we could uh, turn the dial, you know, one percent or something, so that more businesses see that their role in society is more than just profit, and they work with governments and communities to change stuff that ultimately will create the more profits. My absolute belief in that. Um, but you know, businesses are made up of people, and people are parts of communities and vote for governments, and we're all the same thing, and. You know, businesses create problems, as you know, and, and it's that they have a responsibility to help solve them. But it's that we bit of three things together. And you know, if I could be a small voice of saying the businesses of the future, the entrepreneurial businesses of the future will lead that, then that's the legacy I hope. Great, thank you. And a final question uh, from one of our colleagues, actually, uh, Jamie Davis Morgan via Twitter, and he's asked, you know, simply, what's the biggest challenge Ella's Kitchen faces? Right now, what what actually do you get up in the morning and think about? Um, 
Let me think about that. It's, it's one of two things. It's either, it's, if you look internally, and look externally, if you look internally, it is motivating our people, rewarding our people, finding the best people to continue doing what we're doing and get that innovation and get that creativity and solve, our, solve the challenges that we've set ourselves. So the people, the team. If you look on the outside of the world, um, it's uh, stability and the, you know, left field things come and can all the planning that you do can ruin a business. So we trade internationally a lot. Exchange rates are, are really important to us. They're all over the place. What's going to happen if the Americans go off this fiscal cliff? What's going to happen? Yeah. Uh, our economy is great, but we're exposed in Europe and stuff. So those sort of things, I, I guess I don't worry that I can't control them, but I know that they're there. and. This VUCA world, you get caught. I get to deal with things that never dreamt of would cross my desk, and they do. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. Go around the floor. Thank you. And Paul. Um, so, as part of our 50 years celebration, one thing that we've decided to do is redefine, rethink, um, and relook at our UCAM Foundation, which has been around for a couple of years, but we, we decided to give it um, a makeover. So, I've got some, some colleagues here that are just going to spend a few minutes explaining what that is, um, because it's a very important part of our 50 years celebration. So, I'd like to welcome up, I'd like to welcome up Elaine Brown, who's a. Uh, uh, One of those young but long-standing colleagues. Um, Paul's also involved in this, and Nick as well. He gets to he gets to have the microphone again, actually, Nick. So uh, you're part of this, and also a, a very special welcome to Rowan, who is um, uh, one of our customers. And Rowan has come up to tell you a little bit more about um, about what this what this actually has meant to him personally. Because Rowan lives in one of our schemes in Oswald Street, and I remember it well from my days as a as a housing manager. He's been uh, dragged out of bed apparently this morning by Elaine. He was knocked on his door. I'll just clarify that. Yeah. Was, uh, <laughs> clarify that. Yeah. Knocking on his door this morning at some uh, very early hour and um, too, early. too early. Yeah. Sorry, Rowan. And I know that actually Rowan was first at the top of the mountain as well. So uh, yeah. So <laughs> brilliant. So I'm going to hand over to Elaine. First of all, um, just a little bit about you. I think it's great. I've got all the generations of Bromford here. <laughs> Nick on the end. <laughs> well, a little bit about. Absolutely. Yeah. A little. A little a little bit about um, the, the background of UCAN. I mean, I'm not going to still mix thunder in terms of after lunch about Bromford, but obviously Bromford work with customers who come from a variety of backgrounds, many of whom you know don't get the opportunities that everybody else has had. UCAN is something that we've grown above and beyond what Bromford do for a number of years now, and it's really been around how colleagues and how partners can fundraise and create money to give customers the first step in. It could be a bright idea for the community. Community. It could be something that they want to do for themselves and the, the people that they know. Um, where we're going with you, Can, is that previously customers have had to contact colleagues and spot ideas. What we want to do now is to open that up to all customers so they can actually apply directly to this fund. As I said, colleagues have raised thousands of pounds over the years through some absolutely amazing activities. One of the things that we funded in our 50th year was the Snowdonia Challenge, which you might have seen as you came into reception. <laughs> So first of all, Elaine, can you tell us a little bit about the Snowdonia Challenge? Yeah, it's, uh, it started off with our flamboyant chief exec, uh, who had an idea and he wanted to offer an opportunity for something that's a, a big passion to me, which is uh, experiencing the outdoor world in terms of mountaineering and climbing. So we took that idea and we uh, decided it was a fantastic idea but could we make a bit more of that? Could we turn it into uh, an, a a, you know, a big program, learning and development program that would offer a lot more in terms of employability skills, the confidence uh, elements for young people, um, and also the self-esteem, all those core skills and, you know, investment in young people that, that they needed. So we focused on working with um, young people that predominantly receive support in our, our supported housing projects. Um, these we we got a group of young people 
Um, and Rowan has kindly agreed, as Paul said, to come and talk to us about some of his experiences on the programme. Our partners, Outward Bound Trust, uh, we work together on a 12-week learning and development programme. Uh, over the course of the 12 weeks, as a team, there's been a number of us involved in this in Bromford. And uh, the programme itself, I think the highlight was the actual week's residential when they went out to Outward Bound in Abu Dhabi. Um, and as part of the program, actually seeing the transformation of those young people in terms of uh, it was very challenging. These young people haven't had the best starts in life. You know, they've had a lot of challenges themselves um, and some horrific experiences. Um, yet they never give up. They there was times they wanted to give up, uh, and we did. <laughs> it was very challenging, <laughs> but we we motored on. Uh, we all got through it. It tested all of us. Uh, I think each and every one of us was put out of our comfort zones, or wasn't we, Robert? Um, but the outcomes that have come out of it, and Rowan's going to talk. I'm not going to steal Rowan's thunder with this. Um, but and I'll probably it's probably time to hand it over so Rowan can actually talk yeah, and make it a bit more real. Well, well. Um, uh, <laughs> it was yeah. Well. It was really good. We, I first found out off Mark. Um, I basically just got given a piece of paper and said, oh, we're doing this thing about going up Snowdon. So I just thought we were just walking up a mountain. And then we did. Yeah, I thought it was a bit boring at first. Walking up a mountain, I was like, no, nah, not into that one. And then I met Elaine and we did a couple of meetings. And I've actually found out about we're going to the Outwards Bound Centre. I have done something like that before, so straight away I was into it. Um, when we actually got there and we started the week, we were doing uh, team building things, we did uh, a wall where we uh, had to get the whole team over this wall um, and then we did rock climbing, um, I actually got to know the instructor really well on the rock climbing, he was a big inspiration to me, um, helped me change a lot of things, um, and actually I wanted to go into doing some rock climbing and saving up to buy some kit as well um, and then we went on the actual mountain track and uh, it was really, really, really hard. Everybody was struggling all the way up. Um, we got to uh, the lake about three quarters of the way up and we looked up and it was just fog and clouds and as we were walking up through all these little rock faces and things like that, the clouds were coming down and we were all just soaking with water. Waterproofs weren't waterproof anymore. <laughs> um, I had a scarf around my neck at, at the end of the walk was literally soaked through. There was no cotton left in it. Um, yeah, so we were walking all the way up. He kept up all the way. Actually, I, I was telling him to slow down. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to tell him to slow down. He was dragging me up with him. <laughs> kind of stopped the guy. Um, yeah, we got to the top. Unfortunately, when we got to the top, because the clouds had come down, we couldn't see the view or anything like that. We all went into this tiny little wooden brick type shack and at ration packs and just all had a good old laugh and sort of looked back on it all. And everybody's morale was really high and we were all like like we'd known each other for years. Like we only met each other about three or four weeks before we went. Um, and in, whilst we were in the, at the Outward Bound Centre, we were all like in tiny little gangs. Like there was three of us from New Century Court, me, Josh and John. And we sort of kept ourselves to ourselves. There's another lad from Bir two lads from Birmingham. Unfortunately, the one lad had to go home because of something that happened there. And the lad who stayed, he actually trusted us that much. He wanted to go back, but we convinced him to stay. And he stayed with us. And he, I think it completely changed him as well. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here, really. Yeah. But. That's great, absolutely. And it's not just about the, the actual day itself, was it, Elaine? It's about building it for the future as well. It is. And we're still working with the group at the moment in terms of a, a pathway programme, in terms of where we take this next for them. Um, because it's obviously it's a fantastic experience. Sorry. I'm getting in trouble. Uh, it's a fantastic experience. It feels as if my mouth wasn't big enough. <laughs> um, and we want to make the most of that in terms of, you know, there's a number of them now we're going to work with on an individual basis to take them on, on to bigger and better things uh, in terms of what they've learned, where they, where do they want to take that now. Um, there's a lot of support that they receive um, from their own scheme managers, um, where they're actually living. They've, they have all come back very motivated, very inspired, and very um, come back with loads of ideas about what they what they want to do. I mean, there's a couple of them. One, for example, Ronnie, um, who 
lives at your scheme, doesn't she? Ronnie wants to set up her own business in piercing and in tattooing. Uh, she's also Polish and she does a lot of interpretation locally within the Polish community uh, and she does that on a volunteer basis so she wants to actually make a bit more of that. Um, so you know good things are coming out of this that we can carry on and it's you know personally for me and the team that worked on it we were quite humbled and proud, so proud of them all. I felt like I'd adopted them all by the end of the 12 weeks. <laughs> You would have to set the mic off you at some point. <laughs> okay. Nick, so how, how's UCAN changing then? How's it going forward? Yeah, well, I think as um, you said earlier, we're looking to evolve the UCAN Foundation. I think one of the things I would say, I think picking up from what Paul said earlier, I think with the work we're doing now with what's called the Bromford Deal, our service offer, we're, we're getting to know customers better than ever before. And what we do know is there's lots of people with ideas and aspirations, you know, to help make a difference, to help improve themselves and also improve the lives of people they live with as well. So in particular what we want to do is we want to evolve the UCAN Foundation uh, to really help people um, to start up and pursue bright ideas. So um, as part of UCAN, we're now going to have the, uh, the Bright Ideas Fund where uh, anybody uh, can uh, essentially apply to us directly for uh, up to £300 to actually fund them, get started on a bright idea. That could be to do with business startup, it could be buying some equipment, it could be self-development, it could be again to help develop something collectively in, in their community, which we're doing a lot of. So that essentially it's is not, what we're going to direct. A, it's not a handout then, actually. It's part of no, it's not. It's not a thing. handout. It's not a handout. Because I think what you know, we're all about as a business, and it picks up early. It's about helping people to be the best they can be. But with anything like that, it is about something for something. And while we're not putting a load of rules around this, that's one of the most important things. The one thing we do ask is that people will share with us, you know, what they've learned from using the up to three hundred pound. Um, grant, uh, so that we can then share that with, with others, look to inspire others, essentially, to have a go at stuff. So that, that's the deal. The deal is to, to share how it's used, what's learned, to enable us to promote UCAN and the opportunities that come with this fund moving forward. And just, and just if you know, if we someone's really successful, we put you know, 300 pounds, we spot a future Paul Lindley, where could we develop UCAN in the future? And I think this is just the start, I'll use the term baby steps from the theme of this morning because our, our vision is that we can build different levels of investment in, in ideas and particularly we are interested in looking to invest in, in, in new business. Um, to help us do that, we are looking for um, collaborators, we're looking for partners and stakeholders to consider the UCAN Foundation as something to either make donations to or to invest in so that we can scale up how we can support people take forward uh, bright ideas going forward. And I guess the one thing we would ask from today, why we're doing this today with, with friends and partners, the only thing we would, would ask you to do is perhaps share a little bit about the story of what UCAN's been doing, you know, where we're looking to take it. We will be getting out some more information about the, you know, the whole principle and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we just like people to perhaps share the story. Absolutely great, Nick. Thank you. Final word, Rowan. Then for you, what were, what what, are you, what have you learned about yourself? Um, on the trip, I learned a hell of a lot. Um, I had quite a bad start, and when I went up the mountain, you know, it's obviously really, really challenging. Um, and it just sounds cheesy enough now, but I've sort of said to myself, if I can get over that mountain, I can get over pretty much anything else that throws at me. And most of the staff of where I live have actually said there has been a change since I've got back and. You can see it in everybody who went as well, which is really, really good. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you, guys, and especially to Rowan, because I bet when you did this, you didn't think past the challenge of speaking to the World Wide Web on a live stream. To... <laughs> we don't like to give you too much warning in case you abscond. So, uh, yeah.
So thanks, thanks so much for that. And and um, you know, I'm pleased that you can report that Mick, uh, Nick rather, managed to keep up with you because that's got a dodgy hip, you know. So it it did very very well. So just about to break for lunch now. So Paul's material, we will. The sides aren't available as they are, but we're going to do a story five of Paul's material, which will be available on the LinkedIn website, and we can send out some links to that as well. Um, over lunch, what we have decided to do as part of our, our be different and be brave, we decided last year that we were never going to produce another annual review. You. So from the comms team point of view, hooray! <laughs> because we decided it was very much a vanity publication and that actually, did we read other people's annual reviews from, from front to back and back to front and vice versa? So, um, But what we did decide to do, given this was our 50th year, is produce um, a digital um, a digital magazine for, to have a look back and a look forward at our 50 years. So so the uh, guys with the crew t-shirts on over, over lunchtime will be able to show you on an iPad, they've got their iPads with them. Um, a taster of that, which is actually going to be launched on our actual birthday, which is uh, next week on the 21st. Um, I better not get that wrong. So we, we will send you out some links to that, but they can give you a taster of a few pages. So uh, it won't interfere with your lunch, I promise. Um, so then we're back in the room here in an hour's time um, to hear a bit from Mick on his reflections of the journey. Um, but there is one thing I want to take away, Nick. I noticed that Paul is sporting quite a jazzy handkerchief in his, uh, and I think the whole flamboyancy bit is is clearly <laughs> seeping into the uh, into, into the wider organisation. So uh, you might want to think about your retire over lunchtime. So uh, um, we're spraying flamingos orange as you as you speak on the car park. So huge thank you again to Paul. It was probably one of the most profitable taxi, taxi rides I've ever had. So uh, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much. Let me serve outside. So, uh, thank you.